So this lecture is going to be focusing on a museum tour, or rather some tours of multiple museums that I have visited uh, in the United States, in Korea, and in Japan. And the idea of this is to show you um, the diversity of these museums in a way that allows me to talk about my personal experience, right? Uh, one thing that's kind of tricky in this class is uh, I'm, I'm not a public historian per se, right? I don't run a museum myself. Uh, so it's hard for me to speak personally about these issues. But this is one area where I can because I'm going to be looking at museums that I have gone to. And um, I hope that will be of, of some interest and will help you to think more deeply about museums. And in particular, um, we're going to kind of start with this idea of how you educate the public by telling a story. Right. In a sense, uh, you don't want to think of museums as simply the uh, items that are collected or just a bunch of stuff. They're arranged in a way to tell kind of a broad story. So, And this is where public historians and academic historians are kind of similar. Right, When I teach a class or write a paper, I'm telling a story. Public history does is doing something very similar. Right, so um, I'm using this. This is from a Korean bank museum, and I thought this was very interesting. This is a museum supported by a Korean bank, and it's it's really neat. They have a, a real a bunch of really cool exhibits that talk about the history of Korean banking, and this one, it tells this interesting story um, about how in uh, 1996 and 97 there was a serious economic crisis in Korea, and the government asked people to give their unused gold. To the country so that they could get out of this economic crisis uh, and this is a exhibit about that and you can see here i think it's interesting you have this ver this mother and her daughter uh, giving this uh, bank teller this gold that he's going to then give to the government right this bank was acting as a collection point and this is of course a historical event um, you know, uh, at the, this is something that happened a couple decades ago. So I, uh, I suppose we could we could refer to it as it's old enough that we I would be comfortable referring to it as history, and uh, it's 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 marking that event. But the exhibit, in a sense, is doing more than just marking that a particular event happened. It's telling the story about how Koreans, to help their country, voluntarily sacrificed. Right, and if you look, I think it's interesting. Both the the mother and the 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 man have kind faces, and the child is is offering that that gold to. On one side, he's offering it to the man, but he's offering it to the country as a whole. And so, it's telling a story about how Koreans pull together to overcome an economic crisis. And in particular, what it's saying too is that even children could be a part of this. Right, this isn't something that was only for adults. So they may not pick up on it directly, but it is going to form people who view this to, to think about this. You know, how we Koreans pull together to help our country, and even kids can help with this, right? But also, of course, this is funded by a bank, and so they're showing how they played a role and how that bank is a good citizen of the country. So that's the kind of story that's being told there. Now, I want to start with the United States uh, and the Patton Museum. And the Patton Museum uh, is a place that has very special memories for me. Um, my f I have family in southern Indiana. The Patton Museum is in Fort Knox, Kentucky. And so we would often uh, drive there. Uh, my dad, my grandpa, and I, we would go there to the Patton Museum together. And it's, it's named after George Patton. You can see him on the left. I mean, that's a model of him. That's not really him. Um, they didn't stuff him and put him in a case fortunately. Um, but that's a, a model of him. He's a four-star general, fought in World War II. And in the middle, to his, uh, you can see he, uh, his revolvers. He was a, he was originally a cavalry man. Uh, that's how he got into tanks, because cavalry and tanks um, perform a similar function on the battlefield. And you can see there they have on display his famous pearl-handled revolvers, right? It's a cavalry man. Uh, he always carried those, and he continued to carry those. And that's why he's wearing riding pants and a crop. Um, and you can see they even have a little mag a little mirror so you can see the, the you can enjoy all angles of those pistols. And there's my dad and I on the right together uh, during one of the visits, one we took with my our family, which was uh, my, my mom, my wife, and our first son. And I think it's cool because, uh, well, I don't know if it's cool is the correct word, but we're standing in front of the, uh, the, the car that Patton was in when he had his fatal car accident. And er l later on, we actually got to meet the driver of the car, which was kind of interesting. But that's the Patton Museum and my kind of personal history with it. And what's interesting is I remember going there as a kid and really coming out of the museum thinking, wow, the United States is awesome, 
right? We have all these cool tanks. We have all these cool airplanes. And there were exhibits about all these wars that we won. And don't we just have a great country? And aren't I proud to be an American? And there was no like overt propaganda about that. That was the story that the museum was telling, right? That Patton is a cool guy. Uh, he was a good soldier. And that there's all these great American soldiers that are equipped with this awesome American technology. And that let us win all these wars and uh, help better the world. And isn't the world a better place for having the United States in it? And that was the message that was imparted to me through that museum. That was the story it was telling. And it's kind of interesting to me to kind of reflect um, on that story uh, and to kind of think about it now that I know a little bit more history and I can I can have been trained to think more critically about these things. Um, and so I, I want to kind of not necessarily challenge that story is to make it more complex. I'm not saying that that story is necessarily wrong. Um, I think it's, it's off in a few places. Um, but I want to kind of make it more complex. So one thing that was, uh, to give an example, is that there was an exhibit about the uh, Americans fighting in the Philippines. Uh, of course, we took the Philippines as our colony, and uh, some Filipinos did not like that, and they fought against us, and, and we fought them. And uh, later, when we were trying to pacify the, the islands, we actually had pro-American Filipino scouts that would help us. And this is a, an exhibit. So these are the Filipinos who were pro-American, who worked with our government to help keep uh, maintain peace and, of course, our control over the Philippines. And so the Philippines then is presented as a part of, of the, uh, in a sense, it's, it's kind of complex because it's, it's not a part of the United States, but it is a part of the American empire. And they kind of skirted that. They didn't talk about that too much directly. But the idea here is that here we are working with this, these Filipinos who supported us. So they liked having us around. That was kind of the message. Um, and then on the right, you can see um, it says December 8th. 1941, a day that will live in infamy, uh, the Philippines. And you may say, wait a second, Pearl Harbor is the day that will live in infamy. That was December 7th. And it was December 7th Hawaii time. But the uh, Japanese also attacked the Philippines uh, at the same time as they attacked Pearl Harbor. And it was December 8th in Japan. Japan is, is, a, is 12 hours ahead of us. Um, and even if you're in Hawaii, it's still going to be like the next day in Japan. So that's why they have that. So it's showing the, the Filipinos are these, these good allies of the Americans, and they are attacked. And you can't see it in that picture, but that's actually a Japanese tank. You can see that part. But there's a little uh, marker, a little card that explains that that was a tank that the Americans and Filipino forces will capture when they retake uh, the Philippines. So it's kind of the celebration of the Americans as liberators of the Philippines from the Japanese, while kind of playing down the fact, uh, how did we get the Philippines in the first place? And it's presented as something that, well, it kind of happened, and the Filipinos were generally supportive of it. Though, again, that's something that's, if you've taken my world history class, you know, isn't quite 100% true. And if we continue, and, and uh, for those of you who may not know me, one reason I'm particularly interested in the Filipino history is because my wife is from the Philippines. And there you see her on the left, uh, holding our son, who was, uh, we have two sons now, but he was quite tired. And so he's holding him. There's my mom on the right. But, uh, and again, you're not going to see, you don't see the caption, but I know from, from the caption that that tank she's standing in front of was used by the United States uh, when we liberated the Philippines from Japan. And uh, my wife's not old enough, of course, to have lived through that, but she does know the stories. One of her grandfathers was an anti-Japanese pro-American guerrilla who fought against the Japanese um, before the Americans came back. Um, and she has stories of family members who were almost killed by the Japanese. So that's kind of, um, uh, that, that's why I feel this kind of personal connection. And uh, this is one thing I, I'm going to try and come back to a couple times in this is, is just the way we react to these things, right? The feeling, um, you know, the, the, and how museums can provoke conversations. Cause this of course got my wife and I to kind of talk about this and to think more about the, the relationship between the United States and the Philippines. And that's what good museums do. They encourage that kind of dialogue. And at the same time, you know, it, though one issue with this museum, because it told this broader story about how great the United States was. And I do think the United States is great. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a, you know, I consider myself a patriotic person, but as a historian, I have to point out, we, we're not always doing necessarily the best things. And th this kind of hides our, our imperial past, that at one time we thought of ourselves consciously as an American empire. Many people were proud of that, right? Um, so that's just something to, to kind of think about, right? And this, it's important to think about your audiences. 
right? The, uh, the, you know, I don't think too many Filipinos came through here. and It would be interesting to see what they would think as they, they did come through. But like I said, for my wife and I, this, this provoked some interesting conversations. Now that was a museum set up in the United States, right? Now we're going to go to Korea. We're going to do a few museums in Korea um, and then a museum in Japan. And one thing uh, that I want to stress that to show again how complex these things are, this is a museum slash memorial to Admiral Lee Soon Shin. And if you've taken my classes before, you, you may remember who this guy is. If you haven't, uh, Lee Soon Shin was a famous naval commander who helped defend Korea in the 1590s when Japan attacked. And uh, the guy was treated oftentimes terribly by the government, but stayed loyal. And even though he didn't get much support, was able to win astounding victories over Japan. And so he's considered kind of a model, kind of ideal person, you know, that even though he was treated so poorly, so badly, he still fought for his country. Um, so that's, uh, and they have a memorial to him. And that memorial does include a museum, right? Uh, I mentioned he was an admiral. And you can see there they have a, a, a scale model of one of the turtle ships that he, he was famous for utilizing. Uh, you could think of it as kind of a, it has the same function as an early ironclad, though it doesn't actually have iron. It's this um, kind of coastal defense boat um, with powerful cannons. And you notice it has those spikes there to prevent uh, bordering, boarding. And it was called a turtle ship. And they're pretty cool. And they have this nice little museum dedicated to this guy. And um, this is kind of in many ways similar to the Patton Museum in the sense that it is designed to encourage you to be uh, patriotic, to reflect back on a great Korean the, in, instead of a great American, a great Korean, and to, uh, to be proud of who you are and what your country is. And one thing that makes this uh, very different, though, from the Pat Museum is the fact that it actually has graves. Uh, this is the grave not of Yi Soon Shin, uh, this is a grave of one of his sons, and if uh, who died during the war when Japan invaded in the 1590s. And if you've taken my my history of Korea class, you may remember we read part of Isun Shin's journal where he talks about the death of his his this son and how distraught he was that his son died. So that's kind of makes it a little bit different from um, uh, the Patent Museum. But you may say, well, hey, you know, sometimes America, you know, Arlington Cemetery, for example, you know, we have sites, uh, national sites, connected to graves. But if you look on the right, and this is one thing that makes this a little bit different, I'm just helping us to, to kind of reflect on how museums do things differently or, or how sites with museums do things differently. On the right, you'll notice there's a portrait of Yi Soon Shin in the back, and there's an altar with a, a, an incense burner, and there's incense being burned there uh, in honor of his spirit. And this is a government-sponsored shrine, and this is how things are maybe a little bit different, right? You you know, you wouldn't think of... Uh, uh, even Pat Museum, uh, for example, doesn't really have any religious components. And if you're an American, you come here and you may say, well, this is kind of a curious thing to have this, this religious component here. Um, I mean, they're burning incense for this man's spirit. But if you're uh, Korean, this is just a part of culture. It's not, it doesn't really appear to be religious. And this is one thing that, that kind of can make these things differently. So when you go to a museum, you kind of bring something with you. Right. And so for Korea, we usually think of, muse you know, a museum to a great person tells us about their lives. But here, in, you don't simply have a m museum. You have a memorial hall that includes a museum, which isn't just about, you know, glorifying the person, but in a sense also kind of connecting with them in a spiritual or religious way. And again, you can kind of see how things might be different in Korea uh, because they have a independence museum. It's dedicated, and I, I've been to this museum. These are, again, our pictures I took. And I've been to this museum, and it's, it's really a museum. I mean, if you go inside, it's got all these history exhibits. It's about Korea's uh, struggle for independence over the years. But the Koreans call it the Independence Memorial Hall. So, again, it, it's not simply meant to be kind of a museum where you're, you're supposed to critically engage with history so much. You're supposed to engage, but in a way that glorifies the uh, Korean struggle for independence. And I want to highlight, um, so it's, 
the message is, is again, fairly clear. It's very, very patriotic, very much emphasizing the need to, to struggle for independence. And it's a bit different from, say, an American museum. We don't normally th- think that much about independence because our independence, we won it. I mean, we, it took a revolution to win it, but we won it. But um, Korea lost its independence. Uh, it was a colony of Japan for 35 years. And um, it was that was really a hard time for Koreans. And it's interesting that they were not able to get independence back by their own strength. They did resist. They did try and bring independence. But they got independence eventually because the United States and later the Soviet Union uh, defeated Japan in World War II. So Koreans got their independence and they fought for their independence, but it wasn't their fighting that directly led to independence. And so there's kind of a frustration looking back. And so Koreans, they, they tend to focus on the struggle for independence but the fact is that they weren't able to obtain it by their own strength. And what does that mean then? Why would I go into that big, long thing? Well, like I said, if you go to this Independence Memorial Hall to get to the hall, and there's multiple, actually multiple halls, multiple museum halls that tell the history, you have to walk for like half a mile. And you have to go through this kind of monumental architecture, right? You've got that mountain in the, the distance, and you've got those two prongs um, sticking up so you have to walk really far so when you walk to this you kind of feel small you get the sense of space and you can see on the right there once you get up there that that hall is gigantic and you can see that gigantic statue there i mean look at the people in there it's huge and it gives you the sense of power right so it's interesting that you have in this the museum is trying to counter um the kind of military weakness of Korea in the 20th century that allowed Japan to come in and take them over. And then when Japan finally was driven out, it wasn't by Koreans. It was by the the uh, Americans and to a lesser extent, the Soviet Union. So they're trying to counter that history, right? They're trying to project an image of Korea as powerful. And that's the sense you get from this. So it's, it's interesting. It's kind of trying to, um, to challenge that narrative. So sometimes the museum... Uh, is trying to question or challenge the the history and to give people a more positive, more optimistic view of their history. And that's what you see here. Uh, And here's a couple more pictures I took while I was there. Uh, On the left, you have cardboard cutouts you can have your picture taken with. Um, If you took my world history class before, you can see Yu Guan Soon on the right, the lady there on the right. She was a schoolgirl who who helped participate in the independence movement. And on the far right is An Chung Gun, a very important Korean nationalist who's famous for killing a uh, very important Japanese official who was part of the attempt by Japan to colonize uh, Korea. And they have a a big statue of him there to kind of celebrate him. And and as I said, I do research on this An Chung-gun person, um, and I think it's fascinating uh, to visit his memorial hall and I was actually invited to go there to help lead a workshop for international students. We had the workshop in his hall. Uh, that's You can see those chairs. That's where the students sat. And behind us was a giant statue of him, like looking down on us while we had his workshop. And you get this feeling, again, of kind of being small and this kind of monumental figure standing above you. And I just have on the right, you can see the advertisement. You can see there it says Dr. Franklin Roush. I thought that was kind of fun to include. But the, And if you, you look uh, down at all, uh, you can't quite see it, but also gives credit to Lander University. Um, but I thought that was kind of a, a to, to kind of t- show you how these things kind of work, how this architecture shapes us. And it's interesting that Koreans would would really focus on this architecture that evokes power to kind of counteract uh, some of the times of powerlessness in Korean history. And again, to further highlight this point, um, this is the War Memorial of Korea. And you look at that and you think that is some memorial. That thing is huge. And that's not even all of it. That's just part of it. Um, It has a bunch of like military equipment outside. It's got all these different statues and monuments all around it. The thing is huge. And that that big building is, again, it's it's a memorial. It memorializes the people who fought in Korea's wars. Um, Not simply the Korean War, but but multiple wars that uh, have been participated in by Koreans. But um, it's, it's a museum, right? But it's interesting that Koreans are tending to understand these museums as memorials. So again, the idea is not so much to critically engage with history, but to celebrate history and have a, 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 a struggle uh, for independence, a struggle for the existence of Korea, and to feel gratitude to the people who did that struggling. And one thing, though, that I think is really cool about that museum is if you look really closely, um, uh, is that they don't just celebrate Korea. Um, it's important to note that the Korean War was fought 
uh, by the United Nations on the side of the Republic of Korea. The United States was kind of the chief leader in that, but we weren't the only only country. Several dozen countries helped fight. And if you look there, um, this is if you go inside the or when I went there, this are pictures I took myself. If you go inside the Korean War Memorial, you will uh, see this, and this is a kind of grave site uh, or model graves that commemorate the the different number, the different groups that fought. Uh, on behalf of Korea, right? And you can see from the flags, you can clearly see a French flag, you can see a, a British flag, and of course that they are very, uh, very much express their gratitude to the Americans as well, because we lost a, a very large number of people in the war. So this isn't just a celebration of national history. There's also this kind of recognition of international assistance in this war. So there's a couple more things I want to to highlight. Um, one museum that I went to is in southwestern Korea. It's called the Kyungju National Museum. So this is a very wealthy museum supported by Korea's central government. Um, and on the left, you can kind of see a, um, that's basically the corner of like a temple. So a temple roof, uh, you, and it's there to kind of admire its exquisite artwork, but that's something that's over a thousand years old. On the right is an actual golden crown, right? That thing is made of gold. So this is a museum which is very well funded, very beautiful, very comfortable, very very well done, and um, but you can see they have a lot of resources and a lot of really cool stuff. But it's something that that celebrates the elite. These aren't the the what kind of average everyday people would have, and that's certainly an important part of history um, is to remember some of the achievements of humanity, uh, particularly if that uh, and especially if you're, you're like a, a country like Korea where you have such a long history, you want to remember that that ancient history and the past achievements of the people. That makes sense. But the, the particular people being celebrated here, remember we had that earlier question, whose history for whom, right? This is the history of the elite, the, the high educated people. So as kind of a balance uh, for that and to kind of supplement that, in Korea you can go to folk villages. And these are interesting because on one side they are historical in the sense that they are celebrating the history of Koreans. This is something Koreans don't generally live in a house like that anymore. Um, there, there are a few people, but by and large that's not what Koreans typically live in. But these folk villages will preserve these old ways of life of the more common people. Now this house would have been something that, that wealthier people would have had, but these folk villages are meant to really celebrate the history of the average everyday people. And they often have museums that have more average, more humble things, right? So instead of having a crown made of gold, this folk museum is exhibiting on the left a sled. That's a sled, right? The kid would sit on the sled with the, those two poles between their legs, and they would use that to kind of help them hold on and steer. And on the right is a child's cart, right? A kid would sit on that, and then they would just pull them around. And on one side, what I think is interesting about this is it's history. It's a history museum in a sense, but they don't, those things are actually like reproductions for one thing. Those aren't, those aren't actually old, but Korean kids don't play with things like that anymore. Right, so it's a kind of timeless history. It's a history of the folk, the history of the Korean people as they always were, and who, um, even if they don't use these things anything anymore, they continue that kind of tradition. Right, so this is a sense of a timeless past, if that makes sense, where we Koreans have this existence rooted in this past tradition, and that unifies us as a people. And this isn't just a, a history of these elite people. This is our history of us average everyday people. And again, you can kind of see that here on the left, they have like a blacksmith, right? This is a, bl a Korean blacksmith shop, right? And this is kind of typical, right? If you went to an American, one of these uh, folk villages like Connor Prairie or something like that, they would have this sort of thing. And you can see the tools on there, uh, down there. And, you know, this would be kind of a cool thing to look at. And on the right are examples of the farming implements that people would have used. So again, this is kind of this idea that there was this, you know, this Korea that existed before we became modern. And, and like I said, it's, it's not saying particularly what years these are. It's meant just to give, give you a sense of this timeless Korean identity of the kind of uh, uh, people. And just one thing I want to point out, it, it's interesting how what we bring to a museum impacts how we understand it. So you look at those farm tools and you say, huh, that's kind of interesting. Those are neat. Those are farm tools. And that's probably how you would react at an American farm exhibit and that's how I react but when I was there at the Korean farm exhibit I thought huh I wonder how those work in a peasant rebellion as weapons 
right? Uh, because when peasants would rebel, they didn't do it very often in Korea, but they did it on occasion. They would pick up farm tools and use them as weapons. And I said to myself, you know, I want, uh, so that's, uh, you know, I wonder what, what the, 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 so this is what it would look like if you had one of these rebellions. You know, this is what they would be armed with. And so I was taking something uh, with me that my knowledge of Korean history made me read it in that certain way. And that's something we have to, to think about. People will often say, you know, a picture speaks for itself or an exhibit speaks for itself. It doesn't, right? My past studies of Korean history led me to think of this farming exhibit in a military way. And that's kind of an extreme example, but you have to think about this. You got to remember uh, when community members come into your museum, they're going to bring their history with them and they're going to read exhibits in terms of that history. And that can lead to all kinds of gap. There could be economic gaps, racial gaps, um, age gaps between you and the people visiting. And you got to keep that stuff in mind. Now, in this case, it doesn't cause any problems, but in other cases, it certainly could. And I want to talk more about this, this issue about how people interact and, and what they bring with them uh, uh, by looking going to Japan, right? And this is the uh, Sawada Miki um, Museum. And Sawada Miki is a, a fascinating lady. Um, she was a very, uh, was originally a very wealthy Japanese woman. She was a part of the Mitsubishi family. I mean, that Mitsubishi, the one that makes a lot of stuff and is a very wealthy company. Uh, she was part of that family. Um, and she chose to dedicate her fortune, her part of that money, to helping uh, children, uh, especially children uh, who were orphans after World War II. And in particular, um, you know, there was a, a lot of uh, relationships between American servicemen and Japanese women that led to the birth of children who were unwanted and abandoned. And she especially worked hard to take those children under her care. Right. So this was a, this Sawada Miki is just a, a, a really amazing woman. Right. So she she was very wealthy, but chose to use that wealth to help, you know, the, these poor kids uh, who through no fault of their own were, were being abandoned. And um, she was also a very devout Anglican Christian and had an interest in the Christian history of Japan. And she ended up collecting a lot of objects related to what are called the Kakare Christian. Uh, Christian is the, was the Japanese word for Catholics in the 16th and 17th century. There were a large number of Japanese Catholics. Um, they suffered a huge amount of persecution and so became Kakure Christian, Kakure meaning hidden, right? So these Catholics went underground to try and escape from persecution and she collected objects related to these people, right? Uh, and there you can see a couple on the right. The, um, you can see a statue of Buddha, but inside is a cross. So this person, this Catholic, could, could make it look like they were a Buddhist if anyone came to investigate, but secretly they were showing their Catholicism. And you see something very similar on the right. So you'd have these hidden kind of crucifixes. And uh, Swati Mike collected uh, a lot of these items. And then she would, um, uh, she after she di uh, died, they, she, well, they, they established a museum. She's passed away now, but they, the museum was established for these items. It's not terribly big, um, it's basically just one gigantic room, but th these items are on display. And I was with a group and we went and go, went to have a, a that was dedicated to focusing on, um, we were having a, a conference dedicated to the um, role of Christianity in influencing Japan. And so as part of our conference, we went to go visit this museum. And as part of our visit, uh, it was kind of interesting how people reacted. Uh, basically, and it, it's kind of hard to see what, what they had here, but this is, this is a, an object from the 16th century uh, and, or 17th century that the, the missionaries brought. And you can kind of see how there's a reflection on the, the paper that looks a little bit like uh, you can kind of see the arms and legs of Christ on the cross. Right? It's a little hard to see it, but it is there. And basically, there was this kind of object that the missionaries brought that if you got the light on it properly, it would cast this, this really neat reflection. And that's everyone's kind of gather around it, ooh and nine, and, and taking pictures of it. And that was kind of the general um, kind of uh, feel when we visited. People were so excited to see these objects and so happy. And so it was very festive. Uh, for them as they looked at this and they're like, oh, this is really cool, right? These, you know, we can, we're, this thing is 400 years old. It can still project this really cool image of Christ on the cross. And you can see everyone is gathered around taking their, their pictures. And it was interesting because everyone was very excited. And uh, 
I mean, and I, I'm, I'm trying to think how to, to describe this kind of tricky. Uh, they were very excited. They were very happy and they were very uh, festive and, and were chatting and talking and laughing and having a good time looking at all these objects. And I reacted in a completely different way and a contrary way, right? I, I mean, I thought that light thing was neat, but to, to me, that was not what was interesting. Um, you know, and again, this is, the, I, I have to say a little bit, of, usually I don't like to talk about my identity so much, it's, that, that's not what's so important, but I'm a Catholic. And when I was visiting this place, I'm looking at objects made by Catholics and used by Catholics who were typically, who often were killed uh, for their faith. And so to me, it was a very emotional place to be in and to, and to be near these objects uh, uh, made by these people. And um, I didn't, I mean, I felt very uncomfortable with all the loudness because there was a kind of sadness here because, like I said, these people, uh, a lot of them died, uh, their churches were destroyed, and they suffered a great deal. And I spent a lot of time, while everyone else was kind of running around, uh, they weren't too interested in this object. Um, but I spent a lot of time just sitting by this object thinking. And this is a uh, statue of uh, Mary uh, that was made by Takayama Ukon, who was a Japanese daimyo, a great samurai lord, a very powerful man, uh, who early on was told, hey, you got to give up your faith or get out of Japan. And he chose to leave Japan rather than give up his faith. And on the way, uh, he was sent to exile in the Philippines. And on the way there, he, he got a piece of wood uh, that was, you know, a, a piece of driftwood and carved this statue of Mary. And you can't quite see it. You can see it's kind of a, I mean, he wasn't a great artist, but... It, you know, uh, he, he got to the Philippines and, and he passed away there just after a short time from disease. But, you know, I, I sat and looked at this object. And if you look at her face, it's a very, very sad face. And I thought of this, you know, for me, this was uh, I was really reflecting and thinking deeply because, you know, this guy, for what he believed, was forced to leave his home. He was a powerful, wealthy man. He was forced to leave behind that power and wealth and become a refugee in a foreign country uh, because of his his belief. And to me, that was very uh, meaningful. It was a very somber time. And so I just sat for a long time uh, uh, thinking about that. And so it was just very weird to have all these people in the background laughing and carrying on and having a good time. Um, but my key thing here is what I'm trying to say is how audiences can bring very, very different things to a museum, right? For, I think, for the, 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 the curator and for the people looking at this, this was exciting. This is kind of neat. It's kind of exotic, right? It's kind of cool. For me, it was something very different, right? And it, it was based on, on what I brought versus what they brought. But like I said, it was really well done museum. It was really cool. And I'm glad they engaged positively. I'm glad they had a good time. Uh, I'm not criticizing them. My point is just something you have to keep in mind as a museum curator is how your audiences can react in diverse ways. And you have to think about that when you're thinking about the message of your museum and avoiding problems and controversy and so on. And to make it a place that's it's, as welcoming and as informative and educational for as many people as you possibly can.